Okay, greetings. This is Mark coming to you from Baker's Green Acres, and I would like to welcome you all to another installment in the Anyone Can Farm Question and Answer Wednesday night live YouTube streaming fun uh, session. So we're going to go on for about an hour, and uh, I'm starting a little early so I can lead off with a couple of announcements. Um, we're going to have a um, pastured poultry one-day class. It will be on the 22nd of June. June. Good. 22nd of June. Um, we're going to start 9 o'clock in the morning. This is what you can expect. Um, we'll, we'll go through brooding. Um, you get to load some chicks, handle some chicks, all that stuff. See how we do it. A lot of discussion about it. Move right on to the poultry field where we will move some chicken tractors, let other people move them, can walk around them, feel them, um, see how they work. Um, we'll talk about water systems, feeding, field health. You get to see all this right real time. Then we'll head into the maintenance shop. We'll put together a chicken tractor. This will be a generation three chicken tractor of my design. And uh, you'll get to see the generation two. Generation ones are gone. We're all, all out of them now. They didn't, they didn't last as long as they should have. Uh, then we will proceed right from there to the butcher shop and then we'll start processing some chickens. Everybody will get to do some. Um, we can have as many as 20 people in the class. <clears throat> and uh, so everybody will get a chance to do plenty. We'll, we'll have a lot of chickens that day. And we'll make sure that we, you know, everybody will leave here knowing exactly how this works. Uh, don't stress out if you've never done an actual kill and you don't want to do that you don't have to do that uh, my wife has never done one and we've been in this business a long time uh, it's not for everybody <clears throat> um, but you'll get a you'll get a chance to do invisorations and all the plucking and and you'll get to see how that works up close personal then we'll move to the outer the inner shop and we cut up chickens package them we're going to talk about regulation, we're going to talk about uh, buyer's clubs, and anything else that goes with pasture poultry. Anything. Okay? And we'll finish when we finish, but generally it's about a 4 or 5 o'clock type of thing, you know, depending on how many people we have. We'll have lunch, and we ask people to bring uh, a dish to pass for, for lunch. Okay. Uh, we still have some puppies for sale. I think probably five right now um they're five hundred dollars and uh you know they'll be ready to go in a couple of weeks and you can come see them here at the farm uh, call and make an appointment for that um hog harvest will be on the first of november that is a three-day class and uh seats on that fill up pretty quick so you're going to want to decide whether you want to do that to go all the way through it's all hands on uh, normally we do uh, one pig per six participants and then we'll have one half a pig that will be for demonstration that's the one that I break down and then you go back to your table with your team and you break down and quite typically uh, you get enough information in this three-day weekend to you you can go home and you can actually do this this process of uh, butchering animals on your own and you get to see our facilities what we have and we can talk about all that stuff uh, you, you really need minimal stuff if you do it with the seasons all right so this is designed to be a question and answer uh, I did a Monday night and I had a subject and it was it was a subject that I put forward because somebody was asking me and I thought it was a subject that everybody needed to hear. And it was a pretty good, uh, it was a pretty good interaction there. But we're going to leave this Wednesday night on YouTube chat for more what 
you guys out there in TV land want to chat about. Uh, we're seeing a big rise in interest of people that are interested in uh, small farms and homesteading. Um, the name of our training operation is called Anyone Can Farm, and the reason that we've called it Anyone Can Farm is because we believe uh, farming is anytime you're creating your own proteins and carbohydrates. And it has nothing to do with the size of your, of your farm or whether it's a farm or you're doing this in town or you're doing it on the porch in your high rise in New York City. If you're creating your own, that's farming. And you can, you can adjust it as you see fit. Some of you might live in town right now, but you'd like to do this. Get going where you're at. And uh, think of the ways that you can do that, you know. And uh, we're, we're here because people have a lot of questions about what they can and what they can't do and um, what would work and what wouldn't work. And this, there's nothing new under the sun, but this is kind of a group of people that come together that have done this type of thing. And uh, the answers are there. Um, I think that the big rise in people wanting to be in the homesteading business is because people are uh, figuring out that they need to be a little bit more self-sufficient. Um, there's a little bit m less stability than there has been in the uh, agricultural world. And uh, we can't necessarily, well, we put it this way. If you grow your own food, you know what's in it. Um, and you don't have to take anybody's word for it. So we're not really here to throw stones at anybody, and I don't. I want to stay away from doing that. I just, for those of you that decide that you want to do your own homesteading, your own farming, um, this is the place. This is the. We're at the kitchen table. I got a cup of coffee. Jill's got a cup of coffee. So that's what this is about. So let's chat. Okay, Jill's my lovely moderator here, and she, if you would please put your questions in all caps, then it makes it easier for us to, uh, to know which ones are questions and which ones are not. The comments are good, too, and if they're pertinent to what we're talking about, Jill will, will, uh, will chime in with it. I see one right there. Yep. Hey, Aaron wanted to know, how old do gilts need to be to be bred? Hey, and... I'm glad you asked that question because it made me think of something. This is me at my kitchen table. I'm not speaking for the university. I'm not speaking for the greater pig community. I'm speaking from my experience, what I do here and what I've done. I've been at this place for four, 15 years. And then prior to that, I was at another place for seven years. The other place was really part-time. I was still active duty, uh, Air Force. And it was just a, it started out as just a couple chickens, then it was a couple pigs, and then it was a horse, and then it was some beef, and it, you know, it just kind of progressed. And what I'm going to tell you about what you just asked me, Aaron, is my experience and what I've observed. I have university books here that people have given me, and I read them, and that's not what I see, right? Uh... But our operation is not a, an indoor uh, climate-controlled operation either. And we're not going for maximum efficiency of the animals. That's not the point here. The point is to raise enough for your family, enough for a couple families that maybe you are friendly with or you're, uh, they are family. Um, you know, it's not a commercial operation we're not focusing on that. Some of these principles can apply, be applied there. I did commercial farming for uh, 15 years, and now we are in another mode, and the other mode is homesteading, where we grow for us, a couple of friends, and we've totally diversified, and our focus now is a little bit more on education than it ever was. So let me answer this question. I feel, personally that a pig, if it were in the wild, I kind of try to look at my farmstead as though it's that I try to mimic the natural world. So if these pigs were running around in a group out in the wild, 
wouldn't be in the United States because we don't have pigs in the wild here except for feral pigs. Um, they would breed the very first time that she came in. So as soon as she was in, like she was breedable, she was gestating, uh, she would be bred. And she might be bred by a litter mate, might be bred by her brother, you know. And she would have a small litter because of that, because she doesn't have a whole lot of eggs that have come down, and, you know, she's small, and she would have a few. Now, I've seen where that works out pretty good, because a sow typically couldn't be around on your farmstead for five to ten years. And if they have a good experience the first time they farrow, which is twice a year they can farrow easily, um, if they have a good experience and they don't step all over them and a good experience to me is when I come out in the morning and there's a bunch of babies running around and they've already nursed and I'm not stressing all night wondering what's going on out there, you know, that's a good experience. She has just a few of them, three, four, five, that's a good experience, that's a good number. If she has 10, then they're all running all over her and a lot of times she's having a hard time laying down because she, they're under her. Um, so I believe that you should run them as a group or a sounder. That's what I do. I'll have, I have four sows right now. I leave the boar right in with them. And the girls feral, the mothers, you know, they tag team quite a bit. And it's like a family group. If there's a problem child in there, um, we would see it, and we would remove the problem child. So I think it just as soon as she's ready, which it seems to me that they'll breed about six or seven months, and they can be f fair enough size to do that. And I don't think that if they can breed first time around, that's a design characteristic. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. That's, but that's what I think. Okay. All that's, right. what, that's what I think. <laughs> Susan wondered, ticks and pigs or any livestock, is it a problem? In my experience, I've never seen a tick on a pig, but we don't have a lot of them here where I'm at. Uh, north of me, they do, like on the other side of the bridge in the Upper Peninsula. Um... But here, I've only seen a couple of ticks on anybody else, like dogs or kids. Only a couple, maybe five, in all the time that we've been here, 15 years. I've never seen them on pigs. And we have scalded and scraped a lot of pigs. You'd think I would have seen them, but I've never seen them. And I've never heard about it either, right? But I've never directly asked other uh, Mangalitsa growers in other parts of the world. Maybe somebody that's listening here could chime in and let us know what they think, but I don't think it's a problem. With dogs? Yeah, it can be. Back east, it's really bad. you got to look your dog over every night when they come in, and people spray their lawn and all that stuff. It's pretty bad. But we don't really have them here. Not a lot. So I would just say there's... I don't know what causes them to, I mean, they were never really around when I was a kid, but now all of a sudden it seems like they're everywhere. I'm not sure why that's happening, and I don't have a lot of experience, so that's the best I can do for you. Yeah, we've never really seen ticks on our pigs. No, never. And I don't know that I've ever heard of it as a big problem with horses through the years, so. Never had them on cows. <clears throat> The dogs get them. We dogs, pick them off the dogs. Once in a while. No one else complains about it. And so. kids. I've had them. Yep. M. Finn has a mineral question. Should I give my animals minerals and salt? If so, should I use a multi-style block type or a bag of loose minerals and salt? Um, that's a good question. A lot of the problems that you're going to encounter with health is going to be mineral deficiencies. I smell something hot out there. 
And uh, mineral deficiencies are something that you can do something about. You really can do something about. And uh, a bag of loose mineral is not a bad idea, really. And uh, you can mix it in with whatever you're feeding your animals. Uh, if you're talking about pigs, um, I think a better way to do it is to make sure that the soil that they're on is mineralized because they're going to spend a lot of time in it. You know, they're going to ingest quite a bit of that soil when they're rooting around and they're laying in it and all that. So short-term fix and immediate fix would be to mineralize them, you know, with a, a mineral, um, you know, a loose mineral that you can buy. Like the feed, feed services have that stuff. I've never seen pigs go after the blocks. I, I don't recall seeing that. Cows will. They'll lick blocks. That's what we usually uh, use for that. Yeah, that's what we use for the cows, like a salt lick. But with pigs, I think you need to use the, uh, the ground up stuff and somehow get it into their feed. Um, we know people that cook feed for their pigs, so they'll have a big cauldron that they'll put, get a fire going under and put all kinds of stuff in it, and that would be a good way to get it in them right there. But I, I think if, if it were me, I'd want to balance the soil, and the pigs should be fine. I have a grow area where I keep my pigs. It's 300 by 100 divided in thirds. And I'm, I've been pretty serious about the soil that's out there. And this year, again, I'm going to get serious. I'm going to get soil tests. And I'm going to spend some money on mineralizing that soil. And uh, I've recently just gone to a uh, biodynamics two-day workshop. I learned a lot about soils. And... Uh, I think that's where you should focus your attention and then everything else will will fall in line because if you're growing your vegetables on highly mineralized soil, then you're going to get the minerals that you need and so on. If you're going to do foraging for your pigs uh, on mineralized soil, then they'll do, they should do well. Um, let's see. This is from uh, a question off the internet earlier this week. Pig huts, floors or no floors? Um, if you farrow in the pasture, how do you get to the piglets safely to treat, castrate, wean if need be? All right, what he's talking about is, is we call them porta huts around here. That's the brand name. Ours don't come from porta hut. We got ours from Farm Tech. And they're about 450 bucks a piece, worth every penny of it. When I got first got it, started to get them, they were $205 a piece. They've gone up. But the ones that I have are 15 years old, so that's why. And they're still around, and you, uh, they, they're in great shape. I power washed one off the other day to put puppies in, and it looked brand new. So they don't have floors in them. Uh, we put a 2x10 or 2x12 across the front of them and bolt it on so that the very young pigs cannot get out. So they have to stay in there until they're old enough uh, to, to be out. Uh, and that will usually be in about six or eight days that they're big enough to get over that and follow their mom around. Um, there is no floor in it. You don't want a floor in it. If you're going to build them out of something else, don't put a floor in them um, because you want them so that you can move them, all right? Uh, mine are, are light enough that one person can drag them. Um, two people can carry it pretty easily, or I can just move it with a front-end loader. Um, as far as getting in there and treating the, the little pigs, I'm assuming that you're talking about castrating. We don't clip needle teeth. That's, you don't do that. Don't do that. And we don't cut tails. Those are, those are processes that they do in confinement um, hog production because the pigs, you know, they bite each other and they bite each other's tails and stuff. And as soon as there's a little bit of blood, they, they'll kill each other. Pretty ugly. 
but the the whole thing about cash trading that's um, something that is necessary in my opinion if you're going to make a feeder pig out of a male uh, instead of a boar you know a breeder um, if you don't castrate them our experience again i know there's a lot of controversy on the on the internet i've i've heard it all like you know just crazy stuff like you go to the cemetery with a dead frog on the full moon and if the pig sees its shadow it won't be i i we've processed a lot of boars and they're they all stink you know they all stink they smell like urine especially if you've ever urinated on a campfire that's what it smells like to me uh so castrating, I think you have to do that if you're gonna if you're gonna make meat animals out of them. If you're gonna use them for a boar, of course you're not, not gonna do that. Uh, how would you do that with a porta hut? Well, you could, and we've done this. Um, you know, pig boards. You take a uh, sheet of plywood, right? About. Uh, Five-eighths plywood, so it's pretty heavy. <clears throat> CDX, they call it, right? Cut that sheet in half, so you get two pieces that are four by four. All right, four feet by four feet. And then at the top, you take a, a jigsaw and you make an oval hole that your hand can fit through. And then this one can fit through. And that they're reasonably spaced apart. Well... If you're going to castrate, you need two people to do that. You can take that board and back your way into the porta hut, and that board will protect you from the sow getting in. And somebody's going to have to hold that board from the inside while you're going to work on her babies castrating them. You can do it that way. Uh, I don't do it that way because I have a system where I can catch all my baby pigs without working that hard you know that's the thing when you when you're going through all these processes you want to make them work better <clears throat> and easier and uh, more effective and that's not the best way to do it I think the best way to do it is to big to build what they call a loader and um, we can talk about that if somebody has a question about that but I'll wait until I see a question on that but that's how you could do it with huts if you wanted to the ones that I have are translucent uh, poly panels on the outside. Uh, they're opaque, but they're still quite light. And if you built it out of plywood, you'd be in there and it would could be dark during the day. So if you're castrating, you'd want to go in with a headlight on. I, I wouldn't want to do it in there. I That's not how I like doing castrating. We have a, a system we do it. And my kids help me with it. And, but when you ask me about that, I'll talk about cash rating. Um, well, let's see. I'm going to skip to a kind of while you're talking about them out on the field. Um, Susan wonders, do you have a suggestion for making portable shade for an open field? For pigs? I have driven my uh, my dump truck out there in the past uh, when I needed shade for them in a hurry and when it was really hot I've done that um, <clears throat> that's a good question and uh, I haven't really tackled that one as well as I should because <clears throat> my grow area they don't have a lot of shade they don't have a lot of shade and I really do need to build something that I can tow around from paddock to paddock to give them shade. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be experimenting this year with bending what they call top rail fence pipe. It's one and three eighths. And then I'm going to use farm tech to supply me with the, uh, the material that you can stretch over that. And the challenge with pigs is if they can get their mouth on anything, they'll, they'll pull it, you know, and they'll mess with it. And they'll, so, like, I put my tractor in there one time, and they could get 
a set of, there was a wire bundle on the bottom of the tractor and they yanked that off right and I've, the tractor's never been the same since that um, they do things like that so I'd be careful putting trucks and stuff in because there's things they can get a hold of and they will my dump trucks up off the ground and there's nothing for them to get anymore there was but <laughs> they got it all and so it's gone um, but yeah, you do really need to build them something or get a sprinkler out there going or something because when it's really hot, pigs can get sunburned. Um, this year, I, I'm not going to talk about this a whole lot because I've not done it, but I got a bag of sun hemp and with the new farm bill that was signed into law, um, we can now grow hemp across the United States, which has been outlawed for a long time. And this is not the, uh, the marijuana, but marijuana falls under the umbrella of hemp. This is in like industrial hemp. And I'm really excited about this stuff because I've read up on it and uh, <clears throat> the stalks can get up to 15 feet high in a season. So can you imagine if we cultivated, we'd basically be cultivating a forest and then turning the pigs into there and then systematically going through and chopping these things down and all the foliage is edible to the pigs. And then when it's all said and done, I don't, I don't exactly know what you do with the stalks, but I would assume that we could cut them into chunks and the pigs would eat them uh, because they're juicy and they're, uh, you know, sweet. So, so a, a pop-up tent wouldn't be a good idea? No, a pop-up tent would not be a good idea. It, it might make a good video, you know, to see how long it lasts. But no, it's whatever you put out there for pigs has to be sturdy. Same thing with cows because cows rub on stuff. Um, the best thing is to build your paddock so you can incorporate some, some stout trees in there. And even then with pigs, you know, they will ring a tree. They'll girdle a tree. They'll go around. They'll eat all the way around certain trees. And I'm not sure which ones they do and which ones they don't. I know they will cedar because they wrecked a lot of our trees here. But I knew they were going to, but I'm I, I going to use the cedar that's in there for something else. So I didn't really mind that they did. So. All right. Um. Using a greenhouse slash hoop house for seed starting. Is it warm enough or does it require additional heat? I'm running out of space for seedlings under lights and I'm thinking about putting up a hoop house to move out established plants. Don't know much about using greenhouses here in Michigan. This oh. is an earlier this week question. Okay. Well, um, a lot of that's new to me. I built a small greenhouse. It's 15 by 20 and it was uh, scrounged it, and I had to kind of fabricate a lot of the pieces for it and I built a foundation out of railroad ties for it to sit on. Uh, I knew I wanted it sturdy and I knew I wanted it kind of tall and it's um, two layers of poly that you can put a blower on that it will puff it out and then I just recently bent conduit uh, a 10 foot piece of conduit, half inch conduit into hoops and then put a floating row cover on. So one side of it has a five foot bed. So I've actually got right in there, I've got five feet by 20. So what would that be? Five times 20, that's 100, 100 square feet, homeschoolers, you know. Um, and I just finished planting it yesterday. I was thrilled to be able to plant at on the the 19th of, of March. Now, you have to be careful what you plant. This is how much I know about this. Um, like dark green leafy stuff, during the day, it will get 90 degrees in there. I mean, today was overcast even, and it got up to about 70 degrees in there, right? Yesterday, it was sunny. I had to have both doors open to work in there because it was so hot. And with, you know, double layers plus the row cover, uh, at night, they'll be fine. They're not gonna grow, they're gonna kind of dormant at night. 
Um, what you have to, I know that uh, if you're going to harvest, you want to harvest when the plants are above 32 degrees. You clip them off then and you bring them in the house and they'll crisp. But if you cut them when it's below 32, you bring them in the house, they'll wilt. Right, so I know that. Um, we've had real good luck growing lettuce, uh, lettuce greens mix. Um, we grew some potatoes in there, grew really well. Um, we really haven't been as serious about it as I want to, you know, going into the future. My, my father had a greenhouse and he really enjoyed it. And I, I understand why it's really fun, um, to be able to get my hands in the dirt on the 20th of March when every, my ground is frozen and I still got snow is really cool. Um, I would, I, I don't know anybody that's teaching a class on that now. I went to one years ago. A guy by the name of Wick, Nick Welty taught it up in Traverse City. And he's a commercial grower, big time. And he grows all winter long in an un, unheated greenhouse. And then I know another family that has several greenhouses. And they grow all winter long, but they do heat. Right? Right. And then, oh, and then I know another guy in the UP pretty well that's got a greenhouse, and he heats too. So the information is out there, uh, and this guy does it commercially. He's got quite an operation going on up there. Um, I am not the person to ask on that. I, I, I know the information's out there. Possibly, if you PM me, I can put you on to this guy, and he can answer your questions. Um... Or you can just Google Shady Grove, UP. Guy's name is Randy. He's really cool. He'll answer your questions. He'll tell you what you need to know. Um, this is a class question, and maybe you could kind of go over what's coming up okay. again. Class question. Uh, Lone Star wanted to know, where do out-of-state visitors stay that attend your classes? But then maybe review the classes again. All right. For our classes, like... Uh, we're going to do a fencing class, too. I didn't tell you about that. Okay, we're going to do fencing. We're going to do, and these are all classes that we've done continually for a lot of years. And I think this is going to be our 10th year or 11th year of hog harvest. Um, November, it's kind of cold. Let them pull up alongside the barn. They plugged it in, and everything was fine. Um, some of the people stayed downtown. So there's the Notel Motel right down in downtown McBain, big town. Or you can go over to a little bit more ritzy digs in Cadillac, which is about 18 miles away. <coughs> and they have, they got everything over there. They got, I don't know, what do they have over there? All like the, you know. Holiday Inn. Holiday and Inn and, yeah. Those kind. They, they have like, there's about three of them that you can stay at. And I don't think they're doing much business in November. <laughs> or if you want to camp out, you're welcome to, but, you know, November camping. Um, yeah, there's no facilities here at the house anymore. We used to have a bunkhouse, but we we gave that up. That was too, too much too much hassle for the thing, for the buck. Unless someone wants to camp. If someone if wants to for, camp, you're sure welcome to. Yeah, for the pastured poultry? And maybe you could pastured poultry, again. sure. You could camp out. That would be... That'd be fine. Um, if you wanted to camp the night before or the night of, that'd be fine. There's plenty of places on the farm to camp that would be suitable. Do not bring dogs with you when you come for any of these classes. Do not bring dogs. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, we're going to a farm. We can just let our dog run. No, you can't because my dogs are here and my dogs are working dogs and they're trained killers. No, no dogs. No dogs. We don't want to confuse our, our dogs with thinking that other dogs are supposed to be here. Other dogs are not supposed to be here. And when you raise a lot of poultry out on the field, one of your main things is predation. And so you really need dogs, working dogs, like Pyrenees that we have. Um, and you don't want them confused with if somebody's turning their dogs loose to, to hunt rabbits or something and the thing comes on your farm and starts killing your chickens, you want your dogs to be aggressive towards that, that beagle or whatever. You want that. 
dogs. So we don't allow all the dogs on the farm. Oh, goody. Um, or other animals. Don't bring any service llamas with you or anything else like that. Service crocodiles. <laughs> all right. This was a question from earlier this week. Is it worth planting forage for pastured pigs since they brew everything? That sounds like a familiar question. Well, I, I guess the best way to answer this is a pig has certain characteristics of the way it is, you know. Um, the pigs that I have are probably the same as the pigs that were here when the shot was hurt round the world, heard round the world. Um, pretty much the same. And they they perform the same way. They 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 dig. They got that disc on the front of their nose and they dig. They root is what they do. They're looking for roots. So when you plant forages for them, the idea is you want them to get those roots out of the ground. So you're planting, let's say, turnips or Gee, people have planted everything. I plant daikon radishes and fodder radishes. I've planted uh, rutabagas. I've planted, gee, what else have I planted? What's those? Mangles, not mangoes, but mangles. Excellent crop. Um, and they're all below the ground. So you want the pig to dig that up. And if you planted mangles and then you put your cows out there, cows don't dig. So they would just maybe get a bite off the top and that's it. But the pigs will dig. And you might think, oh, digging's a bad thing. No, digging is a good thing. So sometimes people put rings in their noses, you know, like you see young girls doing these days. You don't want to do that because you that discourages the pig from digging. He'll still dig a little bit because they just can't not dig. But you want them to dig because what are they doing? They're doing the harvest for you. It's like a direct feeding. And they're going to till that soil for you. They're going to disturb it, as uh, Joel Salatin always says. You want them to disturb that soil. On my grow area, and you, you can go back and you can look at videos um, in the playlist on Baker's Green Acres YouTube, you see what I plant. And th there was one that I did about forage radishes, which was really cool because it's this radish that's like this long. And about this much of it is above the ground. And they, they're pretty heavy. And they have a great big plume top on it. It looks like tobacco leaves. And the pigs eat all that. And then they go after the radish. And the tip of the radish, I guess, is really sweet, so they want that. And they'll go all the way down there and get that. When that field is ready for them to move off, there is not anything out there. It is just all soil. It's all been turned. All their manure has been turned into it. All their urine has been turned into it. And then I basically can go out there very quickly with a harrow and drive over it kind of smooth it out, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, it's not a golf course. It doesn't need to be real smooth. There can be, there can be holes that are 10 inches deep or they won't be 20 inches deep because after they've gone through that they're actually digging one hole and filling in another hole, you know, so it all kind of evens out. And then I plant it because I, you know, I don't have to do any defoliating or anything like that. I don't use any Roundup. I don't use any uh, chemical fertilizer or anything like that because they've done all that um, and this falls into the category of um, you, you know you've heard there ain't no free lunch well in farming there is a free lunch because to plant a hundred by a hundred is going to cost me about less than five dollars in seed uh, uh, you know really good seed mango it would be twenty five dollars let's say the poundage of forage that I'm going to get off of that is phenomenal. Do the math on it. Let's say you get five pounds per square foot. And 100 by 100 times five, whatever that is. I, I can't remember. I've done the calculation before, and it was in that video. I just don't recall right now. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> and 
that's all stuff that you don't have to feed your pigs. And while they're doing that, they're fertilizing the ground. And, you know, it's just getting better all the time, you know. And you, you will supplement their feed to get them to grow a little faster. But it's, it's a pretty neat thing. And the, the way my field is divided up into three sections, I can have them on a section eating and then the other two sections are growing and what's nice about it is let's say that you were going to raise a uh, hundred by a hundred ten thousand square feet for of uh of turnips to take to the farmer's market let's say well you got to go out there and plant them you got to go out there and you got to water them and you got to go out there and harvest them and they better be the right size, and they better not have a split in them, and they better not have a wormhole in them, because take them to the farmer's market, you're not going to sell them. Nobody will want them. They'll go to the guy that is spraying his things down with chemical fertilizer so that there's no splits in them, there's no worms in them. These are going to be organic, you know, if, if, we, if you wanted to go that route, and your pigs are going to dig them up, and they don't care if they're big, they don't care if they're small, they don't care if they got a split in them or a wormhole in them. It's even better if it's got a worm in it. So it's a win-win. Your pigs are getting bigger, you know, so they're putting on weight, and your field is getting more fertile, and they're doing the tillage for you. So tell me there ain't no free lunch. You don't pay for the, the rain, you don't pay for the wind, you don't pay for the, the air that's providing the, you know, the necessary components for uh, photosynthesis. You don't pay for the sunlight that's coming down. So there is a free lunch. There's certainly a free lunch. Um, real quick one, Joe, Brown Joe wanted to know where you get your radishes. Joe. Joe who? Joe Brown. Joe Brown. We get them from Maine, Joe Brown. Wicked good Maine. <laughs> What's the name of that place? Fedco. Fedco. Joe, I know Joe Brown, and he's from Maine. And uh, I was stationed in Maine, and Maine is wicked good. Wicked good. People in Maine say wicked a lot. This is a wicked good thing to say. Farming's wicked good. Fedco, Joe. And they also have hemp this year. And I planted some yesterday in my greenhouse, so I get to see that come up. I'm real excited about hemp. Yep. And actually, if you go to, um, I think their site is fedco.com and get their catalog, it's got a lot of information and they've got a lot of different forages that you can get. Too. Yeah. So, um, Fedco, Johnny's, um, I can't think of the other ones now. Well, those are the two I order from. The, there's lots and lots of seed places. but. Okay. I, I should probably put in a plug for... Our training program that we do, it's called uh, Anyone Can Farm Homesteaders Guild. And it's broken into down into four sections that coincide with the seasons. And then each section is 12 weeks. And it's kind of my agenda that if you are approaching me and saying, what do I need to do? What do I need to know to be an effective homesteader? I give you the subjects and I give you one a week. And then I support it with a few small videos during the way, just things that I'm doing around here. And then we get together Tuesday night at 7 o'clock for a Zoom call. And that's where, you know, I'm on the computer and you're on the computer and we get to converse. And last night was lively. We had, you know, March Madness going on. And, you know, some of our newer members are kind of freaking out because life is happening and some of the older members are kind of chuckling at, chuckling at them a little bit and reminding them that uh, this is all part of it. You know, it's not all sunshine and lollipops. There's definitely difficulties along the way, but that gives you perspective. And, you know, there's good days. Like, this is a good day for us. We've got a good day's work in today. I'm in a nice warm house, and I'm going to have a really good dinner as soon as we get done here. <laughs> all fair from... Baker's Green Acres. Um, this is a question from N. Finn. My new red wattle pigs don't eat the bread I give them. How to get them to start eating it? Don't feed them anything else. That's it. They won't starve. 
The same thing happens with people say, my pigs won't eat hay. Well, they will if you don't give them, you know, anything else. It's like your kids. If all there is to eat in the house is carrots, they will eat carrots. You've got to be a little kind of a tough lover here. Um, if you have an overage of something, cut out everything else. After a day or two and their bellies are, are empty, they will eat bread. I feed a lot of bread. I have a contract, a disposal contract with a company that bakes really nice bread. I probably shouldn't mention it. Really nice bread. And it goes, the shelf life on it is it's really short. So we get about 10 yards a week. And uh, it's way more than I need. And I partner with a couple other farms and I feed a lot of bread. I feed basically bread and hay all winter long and then we get forages and um, we have a processing shop on the on the farm so we butcher a lot of chickens in the summertime and they get heads, feet and guts which is a pretty legitimate source of, um, of protein. All right, this is, oh, Bryce Mosier has a question for you. I know this guy, he's a neighbor. <laughs> Any tips for bringing up a lone orphan piggy? She is on day four now, and so far so good, but if you got any tips, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Nikki has it in the house, feeding it goat's milk. Um... If you've made it four days, you've made it. I mean, if you can, you just have to be disciplined enough to get up at night and feed it a couple of times. But we've done this a lot, and uh, they won't let you sleep. You'd have to sleep with earplugs because they get pretty feisty when they want something to eat, and you get up. And what we did, and still do, is we get a hypodermic, syringe and a pretty good size one and then we'll make up if you don't have goat's milk um cow's milk will give them the scoots it'll give it'll give them scours so what you do is you take a little bit of canned milk right and then we put caro syrup in it mm, no i use just Milk. Regular milk? Oh, okay. Regular milk and what else? Uh, molasses. Regular milk and molasses. Yep. That's okay. it. All right. There you go. And at at other times when we have pigs that get really cold and they farrow in the wintertime, um, we'll bring them in and get them warmed up and give them a good shot of energy. And then when they get feisty again, we'll take them back out and put them with their mom. So... Is there a possibility you can get this pig on her mom? Um, if not, four days, she should make it. You know, just make sure that she's fed and keep her warm. And I can't see why she wouldn't make it. You'll figure it out, Bryce. <laughs> it sounds like they're off to a good start. Yeah. Goat's milk is a great thing. You can throw a little molasses in there for it, but yeah. you're doing good. It's just the screaming at 2 a.m. that'll get you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Puppies too. Yep. We've had a lot of animals in the house. When you're in the <laughs> livestock business, yeah, you have a lot of animals in the house. When it's really cold out, that's usually when they do it. Part of what we talked about last night in Homesteaders Guild was Murphy's Law. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And then when it goes wrong, something else will go wrong because of it and so on and so on. And it's like, you can quit if you want, but you really can't. Um, it's it's how you deal with it when it goes wrong and just being prepared for it because stuff does go wrong. That's just the way it is. Always does. Always will. <clears throat> Any dog, more? Dog question from Lone Star. Lone Star. Would your killer guard dogs do well in hot weather? Yeah, they do. Um... The Great Pyrenees, uh, it looks like they wouldn't because they're so hairy, but the hair actually is a, an insulation from the heat. 
And what they do is they'll get themselves a, they'll dig out a place in the shade and then they'll put their belly right down on the ground and they, they cool themselves off that way. So they do fine because, you know, it gets hot here in the summertime too. And they're, they're swimmers, you know, so people have them all over the United States. I can't say that I think that they're designed for cold weather. It just looks that way, but they do very well in the cold weather. They're just good dogs. They're real good dogs. I, I don't think that... We haven't seen another dog. You know, we've been to a lot of farms, and we've had a lot of dogs, and uh, we have a lot of friends uh, that have dogs, and I haven't seen another dog that I like better than these. Um, the Anatolian... Is it Anatolian Shepherd? Mm-hmm. It looks kind of like these dogs, but it's tall, lanky, um... A little bit different face on it. Uh, I was down to Joel Salatin's place a few years ago. I understand his dog had died, though. He had this dog named Michael. And uh, I liked that dog, but I didn't see, you know, the $1,500 price tag on, on those when I've seen them around. Like, I didn't see, oh, you know, this is, it's $1,000. It's worth $1,000 more than a. A Great Pyrenees. Generally, Great, Great Pyrenees are between five hundred and a thousand, but like we sell them for five hundred because they don't have papers or anything like that. And most of the people that are buying them are farm people. So, unless it's you, Lone Star, and I know you're a rich guy. <laughs> um, also, wanted to know how heavy do they get? Uh, Obi's about one forty right now. Last we, last we knew, he's a big. If he was sitting here, his head would be. Right here. He's big. Got a big old face on him. If you go to bakersgreenacres.com, there's lots of pictures of the dogs and the pups and all that stuff. Or our Facebook page has a lot of pictures. Yeah, Facebook has uh, Bakers Green Acres Facebook. There's quite a few photos. Yep. All right. This is another one from earlier this week on the Internet. Uh, what can I do in an apartment to practice and get ready for when I get property? Currently have a small potted garden, but what else can I do? Um, I think you're you're on to something there. Um, my father, my mother and father moved from our place, uh, the house that I grew up on, and I think there was probably two or three acres there. And uh, my father had a big garden, and he had a greenhouse, and there was no livestock, and, you know, we were... It was kind of in town. But uh, when he moved, they moved to a condominium, and he really got into growing tomatoes in buckets. And he was turning all his neighbors on to cherry tomatoes and vine-ripened tomatoes and stuff. He really gets into it. He was just really uh, into a certain thing really heavy, you know. And he really got into that. He grew a lot of stuff in containers. So you can do that. Um, you know, it's not the same as having a plot of ground, for sure. Uh, but some of the principles will apply. I mean, you got to have soil samples and got to make sure you feed your soils. And then in the, in the off season, you're going to have to do something with those pots. And, you know, your soil is alive, so you're going to want to treat it like a living thing. And... I guess if it were me, what I would do is I'd get you a bookshelf and then I'd start perusing and asking questions about what books should I get and start getting those books and start reading and go to the internet and watch videos. There's people doing homestead stuff that's just incredible. And, and I, I don't mean that it's like intricate. I mean it's just people who are trained in other things that bring their accounting skills to, you know, the homestead. And so they have a totally different bent on what they're doing. And that's an example, and I don't know anybody that's actually doing that. But, uh, you know, a lot of these people are not, they're not from farm families. They're just living intentionally, and they're living the way they want to, doing what they want to do, kind of like what we do. We're definitely living intentionally. Me and Jill, are, neither of us are farm kids. Um, my grandfather had a city lot in Boston 
and he did a great big garden and a little tiny greenhouse and him and my grandmother they grew I think most of their own food and when I would go to his house it was I just remember the way it smelled and you know the rich soils and stuff that he had there so um, but the biggest component that you should be working on now that you won't be working on when you have your property and you will have your property um, is right here your education get as many tools in your toolbox as you can learn how to you know let's say that you're gonna you want to raise sheep or goats people always want to raise goats learn how to fence because the worst thing you can do is go and buy some goats and get all geeked on how cute they are and then you come home from work and they're on your car you know you want to know how to fence so you can fence animals in and also fence them out I would assume if you're gonna homestead you want to grow some stuff and you probably want to have some livestock too you can't have them all together you know you, you can't have your cows in your in your garden you can't have your pigs in your garden you want a clear barrier and it's gonna be a good barrier build the fence you got to be able to build the fence you gotta keep the pigs out of your garden We've had problems here. Even when you can build them, they're organized. As soon as you leave, they don't know how to turn the fencers off. They're organized. <laughs> and other things too. I mean, get your start getting some of your tools together. That would be the coolest thing, I would think. You know, you're a wannabe farmer. You start collecting up tools. Go to antique shops and, and find out. Get tools that have already had hands on them, that there's a spirit in those tools. It's nothing like that. And, uh, you know, really decide what you want. You should take the Homesteaders Guild class because the, the winter season was mostly intellectual material. Uh, we talked about building a plan. You got to have a plan. You got to have a plan. And I mean, you can veer off from the plan, but you got to have a plan. You got to have a direction that you're going. So yeah, sign up for the spring class. I mean, it's not that much, and it'll kind of um, force you to come and and talk about the things that we're going to do, and then you kind of we'll walk you through the things that we're going to be doing for the for the summer. It's going to be a cool summer session. It's going to be really cool, or spring, and then summer will be cool too. It's all going to be cool. <laughs> Nick wants to know, do older pigs do well on waste milk? I've never, I've never done it. Yeah, we got all that milk from, that spoiled yeah. up at Decams. Oh yeah, I did, I did, I forgot. Um, it was the winter, bef it was last winter, uh, I got probably six totes of milk that had um it wasn't actually spoiled it was just it didn't temp correctly and they couldn't ship it and so the guy let me have it normally they just pour it down the drain or take it out in the fields and apply it and he let me have it and i brought it home and let's see what did i do i left it sit on the back of my dump truck and then i ran a hose into a trough and every day i would fill that trough up with milk and yeah we had we did have adult pigs out there and they did fine on it and that went on for quite a while until it froze and then in the spring i finished it off it's so yeah i would say yeah it works really good it's protein they love it the only problem with feeding in the winter is they get covered with it and then they're wet but yeah some people go. swear by their milk fed pigs so do they yep time honored time honored feed um, Joe wondered, would radishes combine well with barley when you're planting? Yeah, but usually when you plant barley, you're going to want, you're going to, well, yeah, you could. I mean, it would be self-harvesting. Barley is one of those things you've got to plant it every year. And then generally they go through and they cut it off with a combine. 
and then you're just getting the kernels. But let's say you planted a field with Yeah, you, yeah, I think that would work good. I mean, if they would grow well together, I don't think I've ever grown them together. I No, I haven't. But for, uh, I mean, I think it would, but I haven't done it. I know that turnips are good feed, and I know that barley is good feed. Whether they grow well together, I think you're going to have to run a test, Joe, and let us know. But I would think so. Yeah, he was thinking, of course, for his pigs. Yeah, for pigs. Yeah, I mean, it would be a it would be a self harvest deal, and the the gain that you get from barley is there's a lot of stock and a lot of leaf there that is going to help build your soil. So whether your pigs eat it all, or or not, it will definitely help build your soil. You know, another good one to plant that you ought to try is corn. Just open pollinated corn. And you can let the pigs on it when it's, you know, massive or small. They will make very good use of corn stalks and, and the corn as well. They'll eat every bit of it. If you ever take a corn stalk and break it off and taste it, it's sweet. And they love them. You know, we always cut them off and throw them into them. But you wait. This year, my grow area is going to be like, it's going to be a science experiment because I'm going to grow hemp out there. I'm going to do field peas. I already have them. I already have my hemp seeds. And I want to do pumpkins too. I've got a six acre field that I'm going to plant with pumpkins. And then towards the end of the season, you know, around Thanksgiving, I'm going to move a big group down there and just let them eat pumpkins for a long time because you can grow so many pumpkins it's it's sick how many pumpkins you can grow all right how are we doing good uh m finn wondered is a grass catcher a machine worth the money does yours pick up leaves yeah uh for a long time okay well you know there's this big debate out there about grow gardens not lawns right and i've seen these memes about growing lawns and how wasteful it is and we've been duped into it and everything hey i took a year off mowing my lawn and it looked terrible it looked like nobody lived here you know i'm not going to do that i like mowing lawn i have a really nice lawn mower that i have wanted for a long time it's mine i love it i take care of it it's orange it's a husqvarna i love it I store it in the winter time, and I like to mow the lawn in the evening. I'm getting to your question, Finn. But the people that I live with think that I'm wasting time by mowing lawn, but it's therapeutic to me. I listen to music while I'm doing it, usually 60s or 70s tunes, and, uh, and I go and I mow the lawn. When I'm done, it looks really nice, it smells good. And the next morning when I come out, it's like, yeah, this looks good. We're ready for a 4th of July celebration here. It looks good. It looks well taken care of. And it fits in with other things I do. I do a lot of composting, and I want my lawn to be as fertile as my garden. And I want my hay field to be as fertile as my garden. I want the whole place to be like a Garden of Eden, totally fertile. And mowing is part of that, right? I can't have my cows out on the lawn because they leave big footprints so I like to mow anyway instead of calling it mowing with this new thing that I have it's a grass catcher it's got a big vacuum pump on it with a nine horsepower engine and as I'm mowing it's pulling all that stuff up and it puts it in this little container you've seen them at tractor supply I got one that's I don't know I got it from Ebel's a store I do a lot of business with over here in Falmouth and uh I love the thing, you know, you mow for a little while and then I can come to the garden and I can dump it in the garden and Jill likes to put it in between the rows for weed suppression. Does more than that too. You want that, you want that earth covered up so, you know, the worms can do their thing in there. Um, chickens love it. Chickens love it. Pigs love it. They love fresh green grass. I mean... I love it. I love to just pick it up and put it near my face. It's just really nice stuff. 
So I don't consider it mowing. I consider it harvesting. So the lawnmower is not no longer dad's toy. It's the harvester. It's the grass harvester. So my lawn gets a little bit bigger every year as I expand my harvesting area. So I can justify anything. But that's what I do. And I would say, yeah, it's definitely worth it. So if you've got leaves, um, I've got leaves too, and I didn't use it this year. I, I'm uh, kind of ashamed of myself that I didn't. But it wasn't a good acorn year, right? So, and we were doing something else in the fall. I forget what, but... Um, my plan is to take the mower or the harvester with the leaf catcher on it and go places and just mow lawns and lawns that have a lot of acorns on them. So when that thing fills, it's going to be filled with grass and broken acorns. And when I bring it to my pigs, I mean, you're, you're putting in your field a tremendous amount of organic material that becomes part of that field, right? And this whole... This whole ecosystem gets built, you know. You want to bring in as much, um, as much stuff as you can that's, you know, not detrimental to the environment. Like you don't want to bring in garbage. You want to bring in good stuff. Um, I talk about this a lot. It's one of the coolest things. Uh, the guys that trim the power lines. Um, they generate truckloads and truckloads. Here we are in Michigan. We, trees grow like weeds. Truckloads and truckloads of branches that they run through a chipper. And they want to get rid of it someplace. So when you see them working near you, and even if it's far away from you, they, they don't mind wasting time on the company dime. You tell them, I got a good place to pull in, and it's right near the pool, and, you know, my... I don't know. You, you kind of entice them to come want and dump on you. One year they did. They dumped on me. And I had a mountain of these chips. It smelled great. Um, it was all kinds of different um, chips. And I spread them around the garden. I spread them in the walkways. I spread them on my fields, in the pig area. There was a mountain of them. And I thought, oh, I've overdone it. No, nope, it was gone in the first year. I just made work of spreading it out. I just used the loader. Picked up a half a yard at a time and just went out and just sprinkled it around. And uh, I even made a windrow with them. And then I emptied my septic tank from the butcher shop on top of that windrow, right? And it started steaming uh, within a couple of days. The bacteria got going. And then I turned it and I turned it. And before you know it, I just had a, a pile of compost. So... Um, I hope that answers your question. I kind of went on about, but yeah, the the one that I got, I really like it, and I will have it for a lot of years. I think it's it's very helpful. All right, one last one. Last question. Anthony has a fencing concern. Uh, he lives in an open range area where large ranches free range their cattle. He is getting pigs this year and wants to fence to keep them in and the cattle out. How to? Piece of cake. Um, to keep pigs in, you're going to want to use like 39 inch woven wire or I think the next increment is 47 inch. So why don't you go with the 47 inch woven wire. Learn how to make corner posts. If you're someplace where um, it's hard to do, then you have to figure out how you can make holes to make these corner posts. And maybe you should come to one of our classes and see how it's done because that's the key. Um, or maybe somebody on the internet show you how to make corner posts. Woven wire, stretch it nice and tight. Use T-posts. Put the T-posts at about five paces. You'll, you'll thank yourself. Don't go... These long stretches with T-posts. Put them close. Um, and then on top of the T-posts and on your corner posts, you're going to have to screw some insulators on and then put barbed wire up there and electrify that barbed wire. You know, So if you have to put a solar fencer on there, do it just to, to charge up that wire. And that'll keep 
the cows out. And then on the inside where your pigs are going to be, you want a standoff one foot out from the fence. This will be at the root at the bottom of the fence and one foot up. And that's for the pigs. And that's actually their primary. They're going to hit that before they get anywhere near the woven wire. Now the cows on the outside, what they're going to do is they're going to walk up, they're going to smell the electricity in that, and if they've never gotten shocked by it, they'll smell it and they'll put their nose again in it and bang, they'll get hit, and that'll be the end of it. Every time they smell that, they'll just, they'll give it, they won't lean their full heads over it. So that's how you want to do that. I hope that makes sense. Hey, we need to give a shout out to our Bulgarian. Oh, friend. yeah, yeah, yeah. Last week, we had somebody, do you have the name? I, I can, I'll look it up a minute. All right, last week, we had somebody from Bulgaria that was listening in and asked a couple of questions, and it was pretty neat. They donated $100 to us, and it's what they call a super chat. Ooh, Lone, so, Lone and we Star just, gotta, just gave you 10 bucks there, too. All right, Lone Star. Awesome. awesome. Huh. I got paid tonight. I usually get 20 bucks an hour. But <laughs> that's all right, because I got 100 last week. That was pretty nice. That was really pretty nice. Makes me feel like doing this. I like doing this. This is... Um, last night, our, our Homesteaders Guild, it's like we're a group now. We're in our 10th week or so. And so, you know, we're kind of friends, and uh, it's, it's pretty nice. But I, I like this, too. This is a lot of fun. Um, this weekend, we're going to be heading down to one of our, our students' farms to look it over and get some, um, get some footage, you know, just get some video footage of what he's done. You know, when they got it, it, it was not a farm, and he... They've built fences and they've built buildings and they've, you know, they've done the best they can to put a plan together. And we're just going down to visit. He's a friend of mine. And uh, we're also going to get quite a bit of footage and we're going to put that up on the Homesteaders Guild page. It's a Facebook page, but you have to be in the group to see it. Um, I would recommend if you're interested in this type of thing um, to join up for the, the spring class. And then you're going to want to definitely take the summer class, too. Uh, that particular um, class is uh, 299 299 bucks for 12 weeks. And then the fall class that we've already done is being packaged up, and then it will be sold so you could view all the videos and get all the content. You just would not get... Um, the live stream uh, chats and they they might not make a lot of sense to you anyway because they're very specific so and that's going to be available for 99 bucks you know so that's one of those things that we hope to sell that into the future far into the future so I'm creating a legacy for Baker's Green Acres but please come see us come to our classes um, buy our puppies and come to our live chats. It's, it's really a pleasure. Keep on farming. Yeah, keep on farming. Remember, anyone can farm. We'll see you next time. This is Mark from Baker's Green Acres. And it didn't.